You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. Insider.com. This is the Option Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell security or to provide investment advice. Welcome to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. And the Wide World of Options radio show is one of the ways the message is spread. OIC also offers a variety of other resources to those interested in learning more about options, including webinars, podcasts, and live events. For more information, check out optionseducation.org. Now, here's your host, OIC's Director of Individual Investor Education, Joe Burgoyne. Today's program is a rebroadcast from OIC's webinar program. Every month, we do webinars on a variety of options-related topics. Check out optionseducation.org for more information. Enjoy the show. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're glad you could join us for the latest installment of the Options Industry Council's webinar series. My name is Alexander, and I'm a staff member here at the OIC. I'll be guiding you through today's very special year-end webinar, The Option Pros Tell All. Today, you'll meet our investor services team who is dedicated to helping investors in understanding the risks and benefits associated with options. I'm pleased to welcome our investor services team, who you may recognize by the mere sound of their voice if you've ever called into our investor services line. This will be your chance to get to to know our team a little more and hear about their learnings within the options industry. And now... Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Burgoyne will bring you our topic today, the option pros tell all. Joe? Alex, thanks so much. You're, uh, you're a huge part of this whole, whole thing uh, happening for sure, and it's going to be a lot of fun to bring in uh, Ed, Bill, and Mark from the Investor Services team, and I'll do that in just a second. Probably have uh, just the things we've got to cover, for a couple uh, you know, pieces of business to cover first, and certainly one, the, uh, the whole idea of the uh, – Disclaimer document, it's important that investors who are considering the use of options do uh, track down characteristics and risks of standardized options. They can get that uh, through the OCC or through their broker. I think many of the folks online already know about us. Uh, We've got lots of education on our website at optionseducation.org, webinars, podcasts, videos, all kinds of goodies. And, you know, as you mentioned, Alex, the gang at the, at the investor services desk can be reached at options at the OCC.com. The icon on the bottom left of the slide is, uh, you know, our, our clearing corp, the OCC, uh, the foundation for secure markets. And um, that's the, in the industry uh, clearing corp that makes all of this education possible. Our, our option exchanges include SIBO uh, Global Markets, NASDAQ, Box, MIAX, and New York Stock Exchange. We couldn't do all this without them. And then for folks who have heard me before, they know this is probably my favorite slide, the snapshot of industry history. We started in 73 and uh, 
you know, it's been a heck of a run from nothing. Uh, 16 companies started in 73 that first day, calls only for the first four years. We've got now well over 4,400 listings of indexes, ETFs, and uh, indexes. And, you know, the, the team from Investor Services will um, tell us a lot more about that. So today, um, Ed Modla, Bill Ryan and Mark Benzaquan will talk about market data, contract adjustments, website investment tools, and then each of those guys, in addition to offering, you know, their priceless insights, will each uh, pick a favorite strategy. So with that, I'm going to bring in the the, the strong group that lead us at Investor Services, uh, Ed Modla, as you can see, 20 years plus in, in the industry, he leads the team. Uh, we've got Bill Ryan, who is. Uh, uh, our our participant and and partner colleague who uh, has the most experience in the team 25 plus years and then Mark Benzaquan also checks in with 20 plus years so it's great to uh, and I think as I said we're going to have some fun um, Ed Modla uh, Mark Benzaquan Bill Ryan welcome how about if I start with you Ed tell uh, everybody who's uh, tuned in tonight a little bit about yourself. Sure, Joe. Uh, thanks for having us here today. And also want to uh, thank our audience, especially the regular listeners who are uh, attending our events and supporting the educational efforts that we provide. I know many of them do reach out to us. The email address you had a few slides ago, we really appreciate those who contact us with their options questions. That's what we're here for. Uh, so we want to keep those questions coming. Uh, my background started in the 90s, uh, right out of uh, the graduation from the University of Illinois. Went to the trading floors in Chicago and spent some time in New York as well uh, in the trading pits of various uh, indices and equities. After about five years uh, on the trading floor in the pits, the industry shifted uh, to the electronic um, uh, system where most trading occurred on the screens. So I did shift from the pits to the screens for many, many years with different various trading groups and trading independently as well. Uh, eventually, I knew I'd get into the service side of the business, and it did happen uh, some years back, getting into the brokerage side first, working with clients and trading firms and high net worth individuals. Uh, that was as a futures broker. Uh, but this opportunity here with the OCC and OIC popped up uh, just over four years ago. So I came on board here to support the industry in a bit different way. I feel like we're ambassadors for options. We're all believers and have uh, dedicated our careers to this industry. So very happy with where I'm at now on the service side, helping investors out. And we hope people continue to reach out to us for our services. And we've got a pretty strong team here. Looking forward to our presentation today. Amen, Ed. Boy, oh boy, that's uh, all good stuff. Bill Ryan, tell us about yourself. Uh, Joe, I'm a, I'm on a, I'm an old margin clerk. I started uh, in the <laughs> early '80s, in the early '80s as a uh, uh, providing quotes on financial futures and uh, uh, opportunity to uh, pad my uh, paycheck by uh, coming in a couple hours early every day to work on margins and learn uh, learn how to manage risk and and uh, the effect that an options contract can have on a trader's margin requirements uh, is what really sparked my interest in the product. I've uh, I've been on the buy side. I've worked on an options trading desk. I've worked on an options trading floor. I worked in the back office margining accounts. I ran a trading desk for a couple of years, and uh, and I've been fortunate enough to be working here at OCC for. Uh, just over 18 and a half years. Well, um, you know, the investors on the receiving side are, are lucky to hear your wisdom day in, day out. So 18 plus years, that's awesome. Um, Mark Benzaquan, you know, you're up, buddy. Well, thanks, Joe. And I want to echo Ed's sentiments about, um, you know, the appreciation for our attendees that have supported our team all these years. January will be uh, the end of my third year here at OIC. I was on the trading floor for close to uh, 18 years. I was one of the guys on the brokerage side 
in the NASDAQ and the Russell trading pits. Uh, when I left the floor, I was looking for something different to do. Uh, I was looking at getting into education, actually. I've uh, always been interested in teaching. So when the opportunity for OIC came up to where I can capitalize on my financial background and educating um, our investors and talking to them about um, about investing and how the markets work, uh, and then also with my brokerage experience, uh, you know, giving them some insight into working a trade and such. It really was a, a terrific fit. Like I said, this January will be uh, the end of my third year here at uh, OIC and OCC. So absolutely love what I'm doing and very, very happy to be a part of the team. Well, it's fun that, uh, you know, we've never, the four of us together, uh, done one of these. So, uh, you know, let's let's – First, maybe, Ed, let me come back to you. And I think it might be interesting for the listeners to hear some of the insights from you guys who are on the front lines. Um, let's talk about, you know, just the options product itself to begin with. You know, all of us have been in it for a long, long time. Ed, what have you found so fascinating to keep you, you know, involved in listed options for so long? Well, so what first comes to mind is, you know, having been on the trading floor, gone through extensive training uh, at the beginning of my career, we're talking an hour classroom before the market opens, bell to bell on the trading floor, an hour afterwards, doing that for a full year before ever putting on a badge, being on the floor, trading for uh, a number of years, being on the broker side, after all this experience, 20 plus years, I feel like I'm still learning something new every day. And questions get posed to us, you can see on the board between the three of us, we're closing in on 70 years of experience, and I think uh, Mark and Bill would agree, we regularly get questions thrown to us that we have to discuss and research and try to figure out, and that's because options are so dynamic and, and they're so unique. There's so many things to learn. I really do feel like it keeps you on your toes. Um, also, from an investment perspective, you know, the fact that you can have a, a bullish, bearish, or neutral opinion or maybe have a short-term outlook and a long-term outlook as well and have an options trade for you that fits that narrative, I find that part uh, fascinating. A stock trader doesn't have that. They can go long the shares or short the shares, and that's pretty much about it. Uh, but with options, there's a trade for you no matter what your market forecast is, and you can adjust the trades as you move forward. Um, now, of course, the, the market forecast has to be there. You have to have the technical or fundamental or the studies that precede your market outlook. But no matter what it is, there's going to be an options trade for you. And that dynamic aspect, that flexibility where options can be used in just about any market circumstance that you can think of and then can be adjusted as the market changes its behavior, uh, that keeps you on your toes too. When I speak to investors uh, they constantly say that, you know, when I got into the options business or I started trading options, I pay attention to my account a lot more. And people love that. People love tracking their money and their investments. And when you when you use options, you really do have to do that. So those are the things I find fascinating, Joe, the, the fact that they are complex uh, but understandable. Once you get and absorb these concepts, they really do make sense. They're not elementary. Once you get some of this stuff down, it, it's not so daunting uh, but there's always something new to learn and to think about. And the diversity of the product and flexibility to capitalize in any market condition is something I've always, also always found fascinating. Super, Ed. Hey, Bill, um, you know, I think a lot of folks around OCC call you Mr. Option. You're the man. You can probably <laughs> talk on this subject. Yo, you know that's true. And, uh, you know, you could uh, talk on this subject for days on end. But you know, how about uh, high level? What, what are the what are the aspects of the options market that just, you know, I know you jump out of bed every day to get to the office. No exaggeration. I so do. Tell us a little I bit do. about it. Uh, options uh, options are the reason I jump out of bed in the morning, um, and my fascination with the product centers on on moderating, reducing, or increasing your market exposure, uh, taking on or reducing risk. Uh, 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 options are a incredibly versatile product. I, you know, Ed spoke to that earlier. Um, if if it weren't for options, we wouldn't certainly wouldn't be here, but. Uh, 
our investment choices would be so limited and with options when I was margining accounts and I would see uh, of futures and stock positions and and notice the margin requirements and calculate the margin requirements and then I get to an account that has not only the futures and stock positions but also option positions that are hedging and managing that position it it it, it was like I I was seeing the world for a new for the first time it was it was it it just uh just the light bulb went off and I was able to appreciate the the power that an option you know that options convey to the user and you know they're they're a they're a terrific product and if you know how they work you can use them to shape and and enhance your investment portfolio that simple, Joe. Well, Bill, um, you know, people around the office talk about your passion all the time and, uh, you know, appreciate you sharing some insights. Mr. Mark, you know, I can't speak to it firsthand. I'm not sure that you jump out of bed quite as quickly as Bill in the morning, but no less passion. So uh, how about you want to speak to that a little bit? Uh, what, what drives you and in, in your interest for this product day after day? Yeah, certainly. You know, and it may not be as uh, altruistic as uh, I'd like to admit, but uh, but income. You know, options are a great way uh, if you manage them responsibly, uh, if you have the education to know what you're doing. It's a great way to make income, whether it's your sole source of income that, you know, uh, you're an options trader and that's what you do for a living, or if you're, you know, possibly a retiree and you're looking to supplement your income with, uh, you know, a covered call, for example, is one of the strategies that we talk to people uh, about all the time. But there's, you know, there's money to be made in uh, in options, uh, you know, leveraging that money that you have with options versus just buying the stock outright. Boy, it's uh, it's amazing. I mean, we're you know we spend day in and day out looking at our uh, option chains on various securities and and seeing where they're trading now versus where they were trading yesterday, for example, based on you know market movement or some corporate event, something of that nature, and just seeing how these things are you know exploding in value. Sometimes it's uh, it's really fascinating. You know, in addition to that, obviously, is the uh, the flip side is managing your risk. It's it's absolutely something that I think is fascinating, you know, as does my team. A lot of people don't trade options uh, because they're afraid of them, because they think they're uh, incredibly risky, but there are plenty of strategies out there that we can all attest to that specifically are created to mitigate your risk, uh, and that's just something I love to, you know, piggyback onto what Bill and Ed were saying, you know, the versatility of options, it's, it's really unlike any product out there. <sighs> I uh, I couldn't agree more. You know, I was lucky enough to uh, be down on one of those trading floors like uh, you guys for many, many years. And, uh, you know, you get that bug and it never really leaves you. I know it, it hasn't left us. Let's, um, let, let's roll. But, you know, I know we have market data, contract adjustments, tools, and then strategies to cover. But before we go there, how about if each of you – uh, talk about, you know, one of your all-time favorite memorable moments being there on the front line, you know, talking to investors day in, day out. Bill Ryan, you know, give us, if you've got a number one or, you know, give us give us something that was very memorable oh, for you. Uh, I've got an interesting story. I, I recall once uh, uh, on a Thursday afternoon after the market fell, uh, I got a phone, we got a phone call and uh, – the broker on the other end of the line, uh, you know, he said, "Bill, I just want to let you know, I got you on a speakerphone with uh, with uh, with my team here, and uh, I have a question for you." He said, uh, "You know, I I bought this index option today, uh, a few bucks out of the money. I bought some index options, and uh, uh, after the trade was confirmed." Uh, Somebody, uh, somebody here in the office said, "You do realize that today's the last trading day for this contract." And uh, I said, "Well, well, uh, you know, which which uh, which index were you trading?" And he said, uh, "NDX, the Nasdaq 100." And 
you know, of course, I happen to have my expiration calendar on the desk. I said, well, today is Thursday, and this is expiration week, and uh, yes, today is your last trading day. And when I was on that conference call, I could hear people in the background, and as soon as I mentioned that today was the last trading day, I heard some laughter. And then it went from a conference call to one person on the phone saying, are you sure? And I said, oh, I am absolutely sure. He says, now, how do I know the, what, how do I know the settlement value of the contract? And I said, well, if you look at the contract specifications, it tells you they take the opening price of each of the constituent securities on Friday morning and calculate the settlement value based on those opening prices. Uh, this Again, this was Thursday evening. There's nothing he could do about it at the time. Uh, I did note at the t when we spoke that his contract was about three four dollars out of the money it was a call option and he was fortunate that the following day the market gapped higher i want to say fifteen or sixteen dollars higher on the nasdaq one hundred and his options contracts that he bought for less than a dollar were worth over fifteen on settlement so he was lucky because he made a profit uh, on a on a trade or a product that he did not know and did not understand. And so, one of my first recommendations to anybody who's interested in trading a pro uh, options, in, in you know, in general, but specifically index options, you need to know when your last trading day is. You need to know how the settlement value was calculated, and I would, we would, I, and I'm sure Mark and Ed would back me up on this. We'd much rather talk to an investor who knows this information before they put a trade on, rather than getting a panicky call one day, you know, right after market close, and he has nothing to do but wait. So uh, it just goes to show that it, it's many times it's better to be lucky than good. And lucky than smart because uh, that that could have been a, a real problem for this gentleman. And he ended up walking away with a, a a very tidy profit. It sure could have been, and uh, not a surprise, Bill. And you know your example of a memorable moment. You're out there educating, so uh, you know kudos to you, Ed, Ed Modla. Um, you know, give us one of your favorite memorable moments, if you would. Well, something that was, um, I think, would be a learning experience back early in my career on the floor of the mercantile exchange in the, in the 90s, you know, through most of the decade of the 90s, the market was doing really well. And in the uh, S&P options on futures, there were high net worth individuals and, and trading firms that seemed uh, to just be selling puts as a way of, of making money. And for uh -huh. years... Uh, it worked, and selling puts on margin continued to work. And, um, you know, you know as well as I do, sometimes you can get caught up in thinking you can't lose. Well, I think it was uh, October of 1997, the fall of 1997, when the, uh, when the market corrected about 7% in one day, and all of those put sellers who were on margin were – Put on margin calls, which meant they had to immediately get out of their positions and could not choose or work an order at a particular price. There were orders coming into the pit uh, to buy at market, and in those market conditions, you know, I, I saw many trading firms, especially the smaller trading firms, that were not willing to make a market. It was too volatile, too crazy. Uh, markets were wide, especially at the opening bell. We were limit down after limit down. Uh, and there was only a few market-making firms willing to put up a bid ask. Spreads were incredibly wide, but these firms didn't have a choice. They had to absolutely pay whatever price there was, and it was really painful for them. So after years of making money doing the same thing over and over again, I think the mistake and what I learned right there as a trader, you got to know your position and expect the worst, or at least ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen here? And can I tolerate that if it does happen? Uh, certainly some of these firms didn't have that kind of uh, risk measure in place, and they continued to put forth a strategy that, while profitable for many years, really was irresponsible. When they were caught with a 7% move out of nowhere, uh, they were stuck, paying whatever price was available to them at the time. They couldn't work their price. They had to get out, 
at whatever price was there, and it cost them an awful lot. And that, you know, on a, on a side note there, that also speaks to working orders. We all know about the difference between market orders and limit orders, and when you use market orders, you're susceptible to whatever price is there. Now, sometimes you have to do that if you really want to get out of a trade. In my story, those guys had to get out. They were on margin call. They couldn't work an order. They had to get out. But you know, if you're using limit orders, you have the ability to work through that and maybe work a better price for yourself. So that certainly shows an example of, of how limit orders versus market orders can make a huge difference. And then, of course, like I said before, uh, knowing your risk and being able to ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen with my position? And if that happens, what do I do about it? And can I tolerate it? Those are lessons I learned right away. And a big reason why was, was that story right there with the market crash in the fall of 97. Unfortunately, it didn't cost you a lot of money. So uh, thanks for that, Aid. Mark, you're up. Well, kind of piggybacking on what Bill was uh, speaking to about, you know, basically what it comes down to uh, is know your product. Uh, and the reason I say that is one of my most memorable occasions, certainly here at OIC, unfortunately isn't a happy memory. There's, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of times that there are contract adjustments. And I know this is something that Bill's going to speak to uh, a little bit later on. But, you know, when it comes to a contract adjustment, the option may not be as it seems. What I mean by that, if there's a split or uh, some type of corporate action that results in an adjusted option contract, uh, it may not result in 100 shares of stock. Uh, there may be an adjusted deliverable. The reason I mention this is a particular situation. We had a gentleman that uh, contacted us several times. And let's say, for example, you've got a uh, $10 strike price. Well, he, or I should say a $10 stock price. Well, this gentleman was looking at, say, the $2.5 call. And for those of you that are uh, new to options, there's a, a concept that we have called intrinsic value, which is basically the difference between the stock price and the strike price. So if we've got a $10 stock price, a $2.5 call, we would expect the intrinsic value of that option, the price of that option, to be at least $7.5. Well, this gentleman was looking at his option chain, and he saw that these calls were uh, trading for about $0.20. Cents. And so normally most of us would have looked at it and said, well, this doesn't seem right. It's too good to be true. I should try to find something out about it. Well, rather than that, he decided to capitalize on it and bought several thousand of these option contracts that uh, unfortunately turned out to be absolutely worthless because it was an adjusted contract. And while I won't go into the specifics of uh, you know, the ramifications of that adjustment, what it really just happened is this guy threw away several th hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, by buying an option contract that he just didn't understand. And that's really what it comes down to. Know your product. Make sure that you know what you're getting into before you get into it. And that's one of the reasons that the uh, OIC team, the investor services team, is here. As Bill had mentioned, we would rather talk to you before you put on the trade than after you put on your trade and have to give you the bad news. So for me, unfortunately, that's my most memorable moment. And it's also one of the reasons that I enjoy being a part of this team is so that we can educate people about what they're getting themselves into. And hopefully they go into a trade with eyes wide open. Well, you guys are something else. I got to tell you, we didn't review the answer, you know, to the question, memorable moments. I was expecting, you know, maybe I get, you know, some, some funny stories. You guys are just, you know, <laughs> so tried and true. You, you guys are just, you know, teaching, teaching, teaching 100% of the time. I absolutely love it, and I think it uh, it just speaks to, you know, what, what you guys, you know, do for investors every day. So uh, on behalf of the listeners, I'm just going to say thank you for your passion to education, Ed. Um, I know we have things we want to get into, market data, then build with contract adjustments and mark with tools. Why don't I turn it over to you to start talking about the, you know, the data aspect of things? Sure, Joe. And then this is, um, you know, th these are some things that we commonly get uh, posed with, with questions at our desk that we have to address on a regular basis. I'm just going to walk through some of those. I think this one our listeners will find interesting and may not have seen it before, at the investor services desk, in addition to working with 
individual investors, we frequently deal with exchanges and large trading firms, algo writers. We deal with uh, data vendors on a regular basis who use a lot of the data that's compiled by OCC. And that's what you see on the screen here. The OCC's website has an entire section devoted to market data, and you can see them go through um, on the left side there, volume data, open interest, series and trading data. There's an awful lot here. And we're constantly getting posed questions by your listeners. You know, they, they may find some of this data interesting as they do an investigation on an equity they want to trade or if they want to look and see how active options have been on a symbol or in the, the overall market. Uh, this section can give you that kind of, of information. So I'll just go through a few examples quickly to show what we have here. If you happen to choose the uh, volume data section, for example, the OCC website will take you to this page. You can see a long list on the left of different uh, research you can do, different data that you can put together. A lot of that is at the exchange level, what, uh, what volume is being put up at various time intervals at, on the various exchanges and overall for the entire industry. If you happen to select the one at the top volume query, you can see that the description there in the center tells you what it is, and it does that with the description for all of them. If you selected volume query, for example, uh, you'd get this page uh, where you can put in a particular symbol that you're interested in uh, or just go through all symbols, select a date range, daily, weekly, monthly, and then run a report. Now, this isn't going to isolate the volume at each contract. It's going to display the volume for the entire symbol, uh, but you can look on a weekly, monthly, daily basis. How, it, how much has this symbol been trading that might be interesting uh, to someone who's trading a highly liquid, a high volume product to see exactly how many contracts are, are going up uh, during a certain time interval. Um, but also maybe if you're interested in trading a more obscure symbol, a product that doesn't trade very often, you might want to come here and see out of curiosity how much volume has gone up this month versus last month or this year uh, versus last year and use the volume query. Uh, going back for an, another example, if you were to uh, be on the market data section and choose, let's say, the series and trading data uh, on the right, uh, you'd come through and get this as your uh, follow-up page. Again, long list of studies on the left, series added today, series download, moving on, directory of every product uh, that OCC clears. Uh, can move a little further down the list and see some information here comes directly from the exchanges. Uh, so the accuracy is, is dependent on, on the accuracy of, of what we get from the exchanges, but it's compiled position limit data across symbols and what symbols are a part of the penny program uh, that allows options to trade in, in smaller increments than others. We also have a list of the weekly option symbols. So those of you who say, I want to trade some weekly options, which ones are available with weeklies? We get that list from the exchanges put it up on the OCC's website and maintain it. You can find that here. Uh, so let's pick one uh, of these examples that's commonly used. If you were to select the directory of listed products, for example, uh, similar to before, you can type in a symbol or use all symbols. You can filter by the type of product that it is or filter by exchange and then submit that through and see what kind of results you get to see what's available to trade. Uh, this could be useful if you're not sure. Are there products uh, that you're interested in trading? Do they have options? You can come here and check out that sort of thing. You can see uh, on the left-hand list a few, a few uh, data points up. New listings is also here. That shows you when there's new options being listed on a symbol, it'll pop up here on the list. And we get that question uh, most frequently uh, when there's an IPO and someone is interested in trading options on that stock. It just IPO'd. We'll get questions at our investor services desk asking us, are there going to be options on this symbol or not? And we direct them, well, it usually takes five trading days to get an IPO with options, uh, but if it's going to list options, you'll see it here. It'll come up on our new listings list, and that's what it, where it'll come up. So these market data questions, uh, they come to us quite frequently, and like I said, mostly it's, it's data vendors, it's exchange staff, maybe back office at large brokerage firms, but there's some information here that might also be useful uh, to individual investors who are curious in doing some research on their own. And that's, that's something that I enjoy responding to is these types of data questions. I know my guys have different opinions on different questions we get. So, Bill, uh, I think you want to talk a little bit about contract adjustments and what they're all about. 
Thanks, Ed. Contract adjustments, you know, it, it's it's interesting, and I'm glad Mark mentioned uh, uh, contract adjustments as, as far as uh, interesting questions that we get on a regular basis. Uh, and contract adjustments has to be our number one topic. And we've got a list of, uh, I think, uh, eight or so. We're going to zip through these real quick. Um, for your typical forward split in a two-for-one stock split, that's, this is one that most many folks are, are familiar with. Uh, the math is very simple. If you had one contract, one $50 contract before a two-for-one split, a $50 call, following the two-for-one split, you would have two. $25 strikes. Uh, the deliverable in each of these two contracts would be 100 shares. Your strike price, again, it was 50. Now you've got two 25s. Multiplier remains 100, and the option symbol, since it remains a standard 100 share deliverable, remains unchanged. Uh, contrast that with a three for two split. Uh, the number of contracts remains the same. The deliverable increases what was originally 100 shares, now delivers 150 shares. So we say the deliverable is multiplied by 1.5. The strike price is divided by 1.5, rounded to the nearest penny. Perfect example, $90 call following a three for two split, you have a $60 call that represents 150 shares. And uh, important to note here, the option symbol is going to be adjusted. It's going to have a numerical suffix. So we got in our example here, we got XYZ1 because that, that one indicates it's a non standard deliverable uh, and uh, or not, it's, it's, it's not your typical options contract. It's a non standard deliverable of 150 shares, $150 multiplier. Uh, now we've got a, the next example is a reverse split. And this is the example Mark was speaking to. Um, with a reverse split, we reduce the number of shares. Okay, the number of contracts remains the same. The strike price remains the same. The multiplier remains the same. Uh, what does change is our option symbol. Again, XYZ1, the numerical one there at, indicates it's a non-standard contract. And the number of contracts remain unchanged. The big change in a one for five reverse split is we reduce the number of shares. So instead of delivering 100 shares, it's going to be just 20 shares. And for special cash dividends in our last category here, um, the preferred contract adjustment is to simply reduce the strike price by the amount of the dividend. Everything else remains the same. Uh, our next examples are for, uh, well, for the first one of the examples is spinoff. Company A spins off uh, a division or a component. In this case, we've got XYZ spinning off TUV. Uh, and the distribution, or the, the change in the contract is going to be in the deliverable, the parent company XYZ, uh, one for four distribution. So we end up with 25 shares of the spun-off entity TUV. Strike price remains the same. Multiplier remains the same. Uh, to determine whether or not your spin-off adjusted contract is in or out of the money, you would have to add the market value of 100 shares of the parent, the 25 shares of the spin-off spin company, and compare that to our original strike price. Our adjusted option symbol changes to XYZ1. Uh, and, and that's pretty much all we have to worry about with spinoff. Now, the merger with stock and cash is company A buys company B. In this case, company A is Nuco, and they, they purchase the company in the form of cash and stock. So the contract is adjusted to reflect the terms of the merger. If I had 100 shares of the acquired company, I would get 50 shares of the new company and $3.50 per share for my old stock, so $350 in cash. This contract would continue to trade under the adjusted contract symbol XYZ1. 
and we have to do we have to do our amateur math to determine whether or not we are in or out of the money. And then finally, an all cash merger. These are very straightforward. Company pays for a fixed amount of cash. Uh, pays a fixed amount of cash for the shares of stock, and the options contracts settle to that same fixed amount of cash. The option symbol doesn't change. The deliverable changes, and these contracts will not trade. Once the once the merger is consummated, these contracts settle to that fixed amount of cash. Um, you'll notice the uh, the uh, asterisk there for contracts that are adjusted for a fixed amount of cash, we would expect the expiration date to be moved up. That's a lot of information, but uh, this is a, these are very common topics and questions we get at the Investor Services Department, and I think uh, I think that's it. I'm I'm moving that, along to Joe, was, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Just like you said, that was a ton of information, Bill. You keep bringing it. Uh, Mr. Mark, you want to pick it up with the tools? Yeah, absolutely, Joe. You know, one of the great things about uh, OIC that I find is in addition to the information that we provide with our investor services team, but I absolutely love the tools on the website. These are some of the most popular uh, things that we have, and I'm just going to take a couple minutes to cover a couple quick ones, uh, specifically the options calculator. And the reason I wanted to focus on this is a lot of times we talk to investors that say, you know, they're looking at an option, the market's three and a half at 370. Uh, you know, how do I know what that option is worth? Well, often, you know, maybe uh, the midpoint is a good uh, place to start uh, in terms of beginning your negotiation. You know, and this is something that we're going to be talking about in our next couple webinars to start off the year, but options pricing is really a function of supply and demand. Uh, but, that does, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the value of the option is, uh, you know, somewhere within the market, but um, there's a difference between value and price. So one of the things that this option calculator does for us is it shows us the value of the option. And you can type in any symbol you want. In this case, we're using XYZ. But you can type in any option symbol you want, and it will automatically populate some of these fields for us. It'll you know, show us what the stock is currently trading at. It will select a strike price, but you can use those uh, hash marks there to move up or down in strike as well as move up or down your expiration. Uh, it will automatically populate what volatility is, implied volatility, I should say, uh, interest rates, whether or not there's any dividends that uh, happen to fall with the stock. And then you click the Calculate button, and it shows us what those options theoretically are worth, what the call is worth, what the put is worth. It also gives us information on the Greeks. Uh, you can see here the, the five most uh, used Greeks, Delta, Gamma, Theta, Vega, and Rho. Uh, and those are, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Greeks, um, they're simply theoretical values that can help us project or predict what the option is going to do based on the movement of the market. So, this options calculator, it helps us determine a value uh, of the options that we're interested in. Once you have that value in hand, now you've got a better idea of what you want to pay or what you want to ask in terms of selling uh, for a price for that option. So options calculator, definitely one of our more popular tools on the website. Now, something I spoke about earlier was the covered call. Uh, it's so popular that it's got its own calculator. Covered call calculator, wonderful, wonderful tool. Again, we can type in whatever option symbol we want. It automatically populates some information that we're free to customize as we wish in terms of strike price, quantity, things like that. But the great thing about the covered call calculator is it shows us, for example, if the option gets assigned. Now, for those of you uh, unfamiliar with the covered call, just a, a quick Reader's Digest explanation. It's basically we are long 100 shares of stock, we own 100 shares of stock, and we're selling a call against that stock to, you know, for example, generate additional income. So 
If we get a sign, that means that stock gets called away from us at our strike price. If that happens, this covered call calculator tells us what our expected return is going to be if we get assigned on that position. And that's really the goal of this position is for that sh- those shares to get called away because uh, we, appreci- we, we get the uh, price appreciation in terms of the stock price as well as the premium that we collect up front. Uh, certainly more on covered calls all throughout our website, but in terms of this calculator, it gives us an idea if those options get assigned, then we um, uh, then we can figure out what our expected return is going to be. Now, if the stock doesn't get assigned, we can type in what we call a what-if price. What if shares go to 104? What if they go to 105? Well, this is going to give us an explanation of what that anticipated return is going to be under those circumstances also. This is a tool that I think is mostly used by uh, advisors, to show their uh, clients how this covered call would uh, benefit them to add it to their portfolio. Certainly, if that fits your risk tolerances, uh, it may be a strategy for you, but this is definitely a tool that uh, you know is not only our most popular, but certainly gives you some insight as to what you can expect uh, as a return for that uh, popular strategy. Joe? Hey, Mark. Is is there any uh, charge for any of the use of any of these? You know, some in some cases sophisticated tools. Oh, absolutely not. You know, I it's funny that you mentioned that. I was just in Las Vegas recently giving some presentations for uh, the Money Show Trader Expo, and I did a presentation uh, about 500 attendees. A really, really wonderful event. And then we also had a booth set up on the the expo floor. And the reason I bring this up is because so many of those attendees at the presentation uh, unfortunately hadn't heard of OIC uh, prior to the event and they came up to me and you know introduced themselves and I introduced them to OIC and they were astounded by the fact that as a not-for-profit organization all of our resources whether it be our online resources our webinars our live seminars uh, all of our resources are 100% free of charge and they were flabbergasted that such a service existed at no cost. Well, indeed it does, and uh, it, it has, you know, it speaks to the leadership of the industry, as, you know, maybe a number of the listeners know, you know, OIC is in its 26 years, so the industry has been funding, and, and now it's the OCC that funds all the education we do. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're lucky to be able to offer all, all of this at, at that four-letter price. So, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, Let's see, guys, we get uh, about another 15 or 20 minutes unless we extend the length of this, and I think we want to be respectful of everybody's time. So, uh, you know, we'll move over to the strategy side. Bill, Ryan, you want to start out with, uh, I think everybody had a chance to pick a favorite strategy. You chose the bull call spread. It's all yours, Bill. Thanks, Joe. The bull call spread. Um, I selected this spread. I selected the bull call spread because I like my odds with a bull call spread. Um, why would a trader select, or why would a, why would we choose a bull call spread if we are bullish? Well, we want to benefit from a, our bullish forecast without paying the full price, uh, either of 100 shares of stock or a simple uh, long call position. So when we establish a bull call spread, we put up lower, we we pay for the spread in full, and since we are selling a call option, we reduce our premium, the premium that we pay up front. So we've got a lower upfront investment cost, we've got lower risk, and uh, my favorite, we have a lower break even. We know with a long call, our break even calculation is the price we paid for the long call added to our strike price. A bull call spread is is quite similar. It's a debit spread. We pay for the more valuable strike, the deeper in the money or closer to the money strike, and we sell a a further out of the money call option. We reduce our break-even point by the amount of premium we receive when we sell the, when we establish the short leg of that call spread. Um, 
those are the you know the good news is lower upfront risk, lower upfront investment, and lower break even. Bad news is is we have to be we have to be correct. We have to be right. We have to be accurate. Uh, we in establishing we're a lucky, call spread, we limit. Yeah, and and we have to uh, we have to uh, make sure that we understand that we are limiting our upside potential. All right, we you know we we don't have the unlimited profit potential of a long call. We have the limited profit potential of a ten dollar bull call spread. It will only be worth the difference in strikes. Uh, and uh, that the other uh, another risk associated with spread trading is the risk of assignment. Uh, in the event of assignment of a bull call spread, the risk is not that significant, but it is still there. We we have the benefit of a lower, more valuable call option that we can exercise to meet our delivery requirements. Uh, we're next. Uh, our, we're we're going to graphic representation of our bull call spread example. In in this example, the underlying security is trading just over ninety dollars a share. We buy a ninety dollar call at two oh five. We sell the ninety five dollar call at seventy cents. Net debit there is a dollar thirty five. So our net debit tells us a lot of things. But most importantly, it tells us what our break even point is. And you can see we've reduced our break-even point by that seventy cents. And for a two-dollar options contract, that's pretty. That's a pretty significant uh, savings. Um, the profit and loss graph also illustrates the maximum profit potential. We see that once the security is trading above ninety-five dollars, we forego any up upside on that trade. Uh, uh, since spreads are, by their very nature, complicated, we're buying and selling options contracts simultaneously, uh, I think the bull call spread is a wonderful strategy that anybody can use because of its simplicity. And well, uh, uh, I will. I'm, I'm sorry. I was going to pass that uh, no. pass that along to Mark. Pass but the, uh, go ahead, Joe. Okay. No, perfect. Uh, thank you, Bill. The bull, bull call spread. And as you say, Mark, uh, you're up next with your insurance policy and the protective put. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. Thanks. Um, you know, back to uh, my trip to Vegas when when I was speaking to these investors. You know, I, I obviously spoke to many of them that don't trade options. And the number one reason when I asked them why don't they have options in their portfolio, number one reason is that they thought they were too risky. So one of the things that I love about options, as I mentioned earlier, is that there are uh, strategies out there specifically created to mitigate that risk. You know, when you buy stock, you've got the risk of that stock going to zero. Um, or at least, you know, taking a, a significant tumble, certainly as we've seen in these volatile markets these last couple of weeks. So my favorite strategy is the, the protected put because it gives us that downside protection with our long stock. We select a strike. Let's say we've got, uh, we own shares from $50 or so. And, you know, we're looking to protect our shares against a, a downturn in the market. Let's say we're looking to protect against a 10% downturn. So what we can do is we can buy a 45 strike put and that gives us the right uh, to sell those shares at $45 regardless of what happens to the market. Um, the reason I say that, uh, again, for those of you that are new to options, when we buy options, we have the right to do something, to buy stock or sell stock. In the case of the put, we have the right to sell our shares. And the strike price is going to determine the price at which we can sell our shares. Now, also the good thing about the protected put is you don't have to sell that stock. If the stock goes up like everybody wants it to do, well, then we're simply going to profit in that long stock position. Regardless uh, you know, of what happens, we're not going to exercise the put, and we're just going to allow it to uh, expire worthless. If shares go south on us, 
now we're protected. It's the insurance policy for us. Uh, you know, we insure things like uh, our car. We insure our health. We insure our homes. We insure things that are important to us. One thing that we typically don't insure is our portfolio. We don't insure our retirement. And a protective put is one of the ways that we can accomplish that. Uh, another thing that I absolutely love about it is that it may allow us to lock in profits. We could sell it if, if we already have a profit on the stock. We can sell a put where it's currently trading. And if stock happens to go south on us, well, we're going to be able to go ahead and lock in that profit. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of time to, to really get into it, to get into the weeds, but if you're looking for more information on the protective put, definitely check out the OIC website, and I know that we're going to be covering it in next month's topics as well. But uh, as Bill had did, you know, let's take a look at the profit and loss chart. One of the things that I think is most helpful to investors, certainly new investors, is to graphically represent their risk to uh, graph out a, a P&L chart, a profit and loss chart, as we do here. Because what it shows us visually is what happens at expiration if stock goes to X or if it goes to Y. In the case of the protected put, we can see shares are trading 60. We want to protect that stock, so we're going to buy the 60 strike put. If shares fall below $60, we're going to go ahead and sell those shares uh, if shares continue to appreciate, they go up to 65, 70, what have you, we're going to participate in that uh, uh, in, in that increase in value. So the protected put for me, it's the insurance policy, it's the what-if policy or the uh-oh policy uh, when it comes to the market. Now, Ed, what about you? I know that you like the uh, covered combo. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right about that. This is uh, one of my favorite strategies to teach. I frequently choose this one when out on the road giving presentations. This is the covered combination or otherwise known as the covered strangle. If you're looking it up on our website, I believe you can find it under, under either name. Uh, this one might be a little bit more complex as it's uh, got several moving parts and is a combination of a few different strategies, hence the name combo. Uh, we're putting together a covered call and a cash secured put. So on the left side here, you'll see what the covered call is. That's long 100 shares and short a call up top, trying to make money with the stock moving higher, getting a little bit of option premium for our effort, which lowers our break-even point, brings in some premium, and limits our upside potential, but maintains that risk to the downside. If the stock moves lower, the option premium gives us a little buffer, but not a whole lot. So we have risk to the downside in case the stock moves lower. Combine that with what you see on the right, the cash secured put, selling a put option brings in option premium. That's all we can make there is that premium receives, and we're on the hook to buy shares, in this case, at a strike price of 50. So if the stock drops down below 50 and goes further below 50 than the premium we received, you see there 49, we start to lose money. So we put these together, and if you look at them, you can start to see, well, both of them are looking to capitalize to the upside. Both of them have limited upside potential, and both of them have risk to the downside. So when you put that together, you enhance all of that, and you can use that to be more aggressive and potentially you can use that to be less aggressive as well, and I'll touch on that briefly. Uh, but understanding both of those strategies is extremely important. You're selling options, so understanding assignment and pin risk, meaning if the stock is close to your strikes, what do you do and how do you handle that? Uh, you know that time decay is working in your favor because you're selling options. That's a good thing in this case. You want time to pass. Uh, you have limited but substantial reward. That substantial part comes from the fact that you're selling two options and you can also make money as the stock moves higher. So that's substantial and your risk is in the long stock. You own shares and you might have to buy more. So you're in a position to potentially uh, lose on the downside at an extended amount. And you'll see that on the P&L graph here. As the stock moves higher, in this case, we're long shares at 65. As we move higher, we make money. Notice at 65, we still may have a decent profit here. Uh, in this case, selling options for 325 between the call and put combined. The stock doesn't go anywhere over the course of a month and a half, and we still make 325 on a $65 stock. That's not a bad return, and that's with the stock going nowhere. The stock moves higher up to 70, for example. We'll actually make that $5 on the stock from 65 to 70. 
and keep the option premium as well. So that's $5 plus 325. That's a nice healthy return. And that's why with this strategy, uh, being assigned is not necessarily a bad thing. You can see to the downside. As the stock moves lower, we lose. And if we go below 60, we double up on shares and have to enhance that. Could be looked at as a risky strategy, often looked at as more aggressive. Uh, but under certain circumstances, if you're looking to possibly buy a large number of, of shares, say 1,000 shares, you're considering buying, maybe selling 10 calls against it, you can actually use this strategy to size down and potentially buy a lower amount of shares, say 500 shares, sell five calls, and sell five puts to put on your full size position at a lower strike. So that's a way you can use it uh, to lower your risk a bit. And not necessarily the traditional covered combo, but I always like to point out, since you have these moving parts, uh, you can toggle your volume and the ratios between all three pieces. For example, instead of uh, buying 1,000 shares and selling 10 calls, you can maybe buy 300 shares and sell three calls and sell seven puts to the downside to full-size your 1,000 share position. Or to be more aggressive, buy 800 shares and sell eight calls and sell two puts uh, to the downside. All of those would be ways to um, lower your risk as compared to trades like the covered call. So a lot of moving pieces here. That's why I, I like teaching about this strategy. A lot of different things you can do to manage it and to either be more aggressive or less aggressive depending on the volume that you choose. So that's covered combo, covered strangle in a nutshell. If anyone's got questions about that, please send us your questions by email. I'd love to answer them. And those are, uh, those are the strategies that we had for you today. Joe, as we wrap things up, I'll turn it back over to you, sir. Uh, fantastic, Ed. And um, as Ed, Bill, and Mark all say to all of you listening, um, we really thank you for your dedication to the listed options product and your passion towards learning. Uh, for me, it was an awful lot of fun. It's, it's very rare we get the whole investor services team together. Uh, we've certainly never done it on a webinar, so I want to thank you guys, Ed, Bill, and Mark. Appreciate it a lot. And um, Let's see. I guess the one thing uh, that I'll say is that if, if our listeners want to get a hold of you guys, they can do it at options at the OCC.com. And then it'll be up to Bill, Ed, and Mark to let you know whether they want to offer their cell number. So you can, you know, contact them 24-7. But that'll be up to them. <laughs> Alex, um, you know, you're a big part of this as well, uh, you know, quietly behind the scenes. So we'll turn it back to you. And thanks for what you do. Awesome. Thank you, Joe, and thank you uh, to the whole team here. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time today. While we weren't able to get to all of your awesome questions, we do have our team here ready to help. Feel free to reach out to them at options with an S at the OCC.com. Many of you asked about further education. Please visit optionseducation.org, the OIC's website, and see the Getting Started section for further reading, as well as um, our additional tools and resources that we talked about today. And make sure to check out our website for upcoming uh, webinars. Investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell a security or to provide investment advice. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have questions about anything you heard on today's show, email Joe Burgoyne at options at the OCC.com. Or you can call OIC's Investor Services at 1-888-OPTIONS. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Like the OIC page on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter at options underscore EDU. Or join their group on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. And be sure to check out our next episode of the wide world of options.
The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com. 